Okay, I believe we are live. All right, welcome back to the Protocol Town Hall, which is a guest talk series happening every other week, focused on protocols and protocol research. Today, we're talking with David Lang about his research project from the Summer of Protocols uh, titled Standards Make the World, which is released in Module 1 of the Protocol Kit. Our next town hall will be with Rafa, December 20th. Uh, you can find out more about the program, uh, the protocol kit, and, and other information about the Summer of Protocols at summerofprotocols.com. And with that, I'll pass it off to Venkat to introduce our speaker today. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, really excited to be introducing um, David for this uh, talk. So I think I first met David like almost 10 years ago. And at that point, he was in the middle of doing this project called Open ROV, which was uh, uh, one of the, I, I believe the first attempt to create an open source underwater submersible. And that project did actually um, managed to like see the whole revolution in underwater robotics. And um, now 10 years later, David is once again involved in a project to take that whole uh, line of thought into the next level. And um, the big part of what, how they're doing that is the standard they're creating around something called the bristle mouth connector, which is an underwater cable connector. And in the summer protocols kit, you'll find a poster describing the connector and what's exciting about it. Uh, but in the process, David and um, his team ended up learning a huge amount about the importance of standards, how to create standards, how to get them established. It's a whole sort of like, um, alternate mode of entrepreneurship and uh, standards setting as like a 21st century entrepreneurial activity is kind of like really exciting. It's not something you'd normally think of as exciting, uh, but uh, David, I think helped a lot of us see why it was exciting. And this talk is a summary of his summer research on well the history of standards and where they're headed in the future. So over to you, David. Thanks, Venkat. That's uh, really uh, the kind words, and and uh, I'm excited to discuss what I learned over the summer. So, as can you guys see my slides? Should I play this thing here? Can you see them? Yep, looks I'm good. Not? Yep. Okay, cool. So I spent the summer researching and writing, and actually building uh, technical standards. And that is, an, that is a weird thing to explain to your friends and family. Um, you get a lot of um, quizzical looks uh, from folks who are wondering why you're doing that and why, uh, why someone might think that's important. Um, and I learned a lot about talking about standards. And one of the things that, that came up was that I realized that when I talk about standards, when I bring up the word, everyone has a different reference point in their head. You know, some people think of Wi-Fi, some people think of the internet, some people think of screw threads. Everyone's relationship to standards is a little bit different. Um, but there's one thing, one feeling that is actually pretty ubiquitous. And this is really well summarized in this XKCD um, comic that came up throughout the summer um, about standards. And the, the gist here is that most people have this same kind of eye roll response of, oh, standards. It's like, it's a, it's a bureaucratic, boring uh, thing that everybody tries to do. And it's just a, it's just a mess. And my goal for this talk, for this um, uh, discussion today, is to change your mind. To move from this place of thinking that, oh, standards, to all right, standards, to be excited about them as a creative canvas. So as Vinkat said, um, my path into standards was um, through a project we started called OpenROV. To, uh, it was a decade ago now, my friend Eric and I were building an underwater robot, an ROV in his garage. Our goal was to explore an underwater cave and we launched a Kickstarter project and the whole thing 
um, really took off. And I'm really proud of the work that we did. Um, the the company no longer uh, Open RLV, the company and project no longer exists, but it transformed. It evolved. So we went from this prototype to a kit product to a commercial vehicle and um, something that, you know, if you go to Amazon now, you can find underwater drones for less than a thousand bucks, which was always our goal. There's tons of industrial applications and and evolutions that jumped off of our forums into um, industries around the world. And the company evolved into a new company called Sopar Ocean, which has built the largest um, private private ocean observing sensor network in the world and is routing ships and doing a lot of really cool stuff. So I'm really proud of the impact we had, but there was one thing after that decade that was still bugging, not just me, but Eric and the rest of our team at SOFAR. Despite all the progress that we had made, marine technology integration still sucked. And that was a connector problem that we had identified. So the the scene on the right is an example of if you're working with ocean technology, whether that's sensors or robots or um, buoys or whatever you're doing, you'll recognize this scene. There are a proliferation of different underwater uh, or waterproof connectors, and the industry had not settled on a standardized way to do this. And it made adding sensing to any platforms a really complicated and expensive and time-consuming task. And so we wanted to solve this problem because we thought this is one of the big bottlenecks that's still holding back um, more ubiquitous ocean sensing and understanding. So we looked for inspiration elsewhere. And I think this is an important, we went, we looked to space. And I think this is an important um, point to make is that most people get into standards through analogies. They, they see standards in other places and they want to try and apply it to some problem that they see. So I think a really common pathway into standards is through analogy. And um, our analogy was the CubeSat. Um, So there's this great report that came out in 1994 from a a Lieutenant Colonel in, in the Air Force about why are space launch costs so expensive? And he wrote an amazing detailed report on all the factors that were going into the space shuttle program at the time and why the uh, launch costs were still um, so expensive. And there's a there's a, a lot that I like about this report, but I particularly like this line. The problem with these boosters is not that their technology is decades old. The problem is that their designs are decades wrong. And he makes a lot of, you know, this is... It's, it foreshadows a lot of the stuff that happened with SpaceX and, and the space revolution that would happen almost 10 years later. Um, but he has one thing in there about bus standardization and off-the-shelf subs- subsystems. There have been a number of initiatives in recent years to try and standardize things. He points at DARPA as someone who's trying to do that. Uh, the reality is it did happen, but it happened from a very unexpected place. It was two professors, one at Stanford and one at Cal Poly, who wanted to create a way for their students to be able to launch something into space. And so they grabbed a Beanie Baby box and they said, oh, this is about the right size. And we think we can pack some interesting electronics in here. And they called this thing the CubeSat. And they convinced the uh, Russian launch uh, uh launch providers to let them piggyback on launches. They created that thing on the right called the Peapod launcher, which was like a way to piggyback on other expensive launches and, and fire their CubeSats off the side called ride sharing. And this, they did this for their students and they started in 1998 and for the first um, almost decade. This was mostly a university and, and education project as they'd hoped, but something changed in the, in the 2010 11, 12 region is entrepreneurs began to catch on. Um, So you'll see that there was just like this booming um, interest from companies to actually use this um, standard to launch new designs into space. It was a really low cost prototyping platform for them. And it ended up enabling a lot of this new space industry that we see today. This is a, a shot of Planet Labs. This was actually Eric's roommates. So this was the garage that we built the first open ROV and they built the first uh, Dove satellite in. So 
This is now a publicly traded company. They have the, one of the largest constellations of satellites in the world and are imaging the uh, every location on Earth every day, running a space program in San Francisco. They got started building a CubeSat um, in their garage here. It's pretty amazing. I was just in Ireland last week traveling, and the front page news um, was Ireland has launched its first satellite, um, which was a, a real point of pride for the country. And of course, it was a group of students at the university who had launched a CubeSat. So this was a, an incredibly democratizing force. This was I saw this on Twitter the other day. This was a, a photo from a, a, trans, a SpaceX transporter mission that happened last month. And you'll see all of the, the small um, ride sharing stats. stats. And I, I don't wanna just put Twitter conversations on here, but I think this is really important. Um, the, what started with these CubeSat ride shares is now just an industry standard. This is a major um, thing that's mostly SpaceX does um, and has kicked off a whole new economic system, ecosystem for um, space. So they pioneered that with this simple student project. And so that's what we wanted to do for ocean technology. And we, the, the problem is there's no good guidebooks for, for creating a new disruptive standard like this. But now there's a great history book. And Joanne Yates was a, an earlier speaker in this series. And I really do recommend the book she wrote with her husband and, and co-author Craig Murphy, Engineering Rules. This, this is, was a great foundation for my education. And a really simple idea um, that I think is important is that these um, standards are a different realm. They're different from commerce. They're different from politics. And viewing them that way is a really helpful tool from which to approach the, the challenge and the opportunity. So they make a list of the three different types of um, standards, because standards are a big thing. I mean, we're talking about emojis, we're talking about uh, safety levels of food in supermarkets, um, we're talking about uh, lots of different things along the, the spectrum of what actually constitutes a standard. And they start to bucket them into different types of standards, which I think is incredibly useful. So like to give you an example, they talk about safety standards, which are um, originated from uh, steamships where um, the boilers on these uh, steamships were exploding and it was an incredibly dangerous situation. It's where we get the term boilerplate uh, is because these new safety standards came in to make the whole endeavor much safer. There's interoperability standards, which is what most people are, familiar with. This is the, the kind of canonical example is the screw thread. So um, screw threads were not always um, uh, the same the same pitch and diameter and uh, standardizing them had a really important effect on industry. Another one that is important to point out is performance standards. So the steel industry really wanted to win railroad contracts. And so they had, but the quality of steel was important. So that the industry got together and created performance standards that helped them win contracts. So performance standards end up facilitating commerce. They don't mention this, but I started to make a list of other types of standards. Contractual standards are a good example, like the Y Combinator Safe Note or the common app for applying to college. You can create simple contracts that can become standards that can really, it's not quite interoperability, it's not quite performance, uh, but it's this whole other genre of standard that I think is worth studying. And I think it's worth like thinking about genres of standards more broadly. Um, and I think this is an open line of, of inquiry for someone out there who wants to dive deeper into the different types of standards. I think we can use a whole taxonomy. Um, the other thing that the Yates and Murphy book does is it separates the history of standards making into three big movements. And I think this was really useful for me to understand where, not only where standards have come from, but where they're going. So the first wave of standards happened, um, at the beginning of the, or at the, around the turn of the 1900s when, uh, you know, scientific organizations and, and engineering organizations were beginning to professionalize and they had their societies. So like Joseph Whitworth and, um, you know, came to the, the society and his engineering society in London and the UK and was saying, we need to standardize screw threads. And then William Sellers did the same thing with the Franklin Society in, in Philadelphia and said, we can do better in America. We can have screw threads that make a lot of sense. They're easy to manufacture. 
Greenwich Mean Time, you know, was useful for the mariners um, in Britain and then eventually for, for the railroads. So prag pragmatism really ruled the day here. It was, it was engineering groups, people close to the problem who just figured out solutions that worked for them. And that was really the origin of standards. The second wave of standards happened after the first, af after both world wars. The world wars really slowed momentum as countries just kind of focused inward and um, were not interested in cooperation. But after uh, World War II, international standards really boomed. And that's when we get ISO, the International Organization for Standards, the big building in Geneva that um, kind of symbolizes a lot of, uh, of big standard um, for, for folks. Container ships are really the important um, standard of that era. They, they made, um, they connected the world. And uh, the, the way that they did it was by prototyping this new way of intermodal uh, trans transportation and then standardizing that design and opening up entirely new possibilities. And then Yates and Murphy talk about the third wave the digi of digital standards, which happened in the 1990s. And they, they mark, they put the ARPANET project as, as an important stamp on that. And I think that's a really important date because things really began to change in the 1990s. Did, the computers and networking standards were moving really fast. And the big standard organizations that had emerged in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were not able to keep up with the speed of, of standards that needed to be created uh, in these emerging industries. And so they, they talk about this as the third wave. And this is kind of where, um, it's not that I disagree with uh, Yates and Murphy, but I wanted to take it further uh, because I think the third wave is really an unfinished standards movement. It is happening. Um, the, the thing about those different waves, I'll go back to this, is when standards making becomes a, a respected cultural thing, we see technology be really supercharged in a way that really benefits a lot of people. Um, and so they call these standards movements. And I think it's really important to, to talk about that. But the third wave is an unfinished standards movement because it's vibrant and it's alive, but it's mostly happening in software. I think open source software um, represents a really vibrant um, uh, standards movement. Um, you know, I'd recommend Nadia's book, um, uh, uh, The Maintenance of of open source software. I know she's, I don't know if she's here, but um, just to kind of give you a sense of the scale of the, of how ubiquitous open source software is. I don't think I need to tell folks this. Everyone's got their favorite projects. Everyone knows this, uh, but I don't think this is happening um, off the screen as much as it potentially could. And I think it's an important idea that we should discuss. So Yates and Murphy kind of really love this consortium model. And this is how most you know, this is kind of the, the way that big standards have, have come into play, where the people work, who are closest to the pro problem are the ones who develop the solutions. So this is what the IEEE uses. This is what ISO uses. This is the, the model that the ASTM uses for starting a standard. So you initiate the project, you mobilize a working group, you draft a standard, you ballot, you gain final approval, and, you main, and then you maintain the standard. And what I spent a lot of time writing about in this essay is something different, which I was calling the disruptive model, because it really is based on Clayton Christensen's model of disruptive innovation, where a group of outsiders just gets something working. Um, and then what happens is it's really important to get traction and adoption within the market. And then what I'm seeing from these disruptive standards is they backfill any of the committee administrative work that they need to become an official, an official standard. So consortia standards making still happens. What I'm seeing is disruptive standards being an alternative and an, an important and an evolutionary like step for how to kickstart standards work in places where it doesn't exist, where it needs to exist, or where, where it has um, become stagnant. This is a really famous slide from the, um, the IETF which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which um, was which created the Internet Protocol, uh, or which grew out of the ARPANET project, which created the, the Internet Protocol. 
And I think this slide is really, um, everyone talks about the last two lines that we reject kings and presidents and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. That That's the line that really was um, uh, taken out from that, that era. But I think the whole slide is actually really important because they recognize and, and Dave Clark writes, the standards elephant of yesterday, the OSI, the big, um, the ISO group, um, that was standing in the way of getting it done today. And he said, the new way of standards making, the standards elephant, elephant of today, it's right here. He recognized that their process was different. And um, this was potentially really important. And I think what he's talking about is really that disruptive way of making standards. And in the essay, I go on to find a, a number of, of standards that, although they didn't really intend to do this, actually really followed that disruptive standards making process. So the MIDI connector, which enabled this whole realm of electronic music in the 80s and 90s, um, was an example of just a few people getting together and saying, hey, we've got to have interoperability here. That's what's going to enable a lot of these new instruments and this new sound. And so the MIDI, the MIDI connector uh, was formed from a very small group of, of manufacturers and makers who, um, and then it became ubiquitous throughout the industry. Another one that I, that I really liked because I um, was Tom Knight's paper about creating bio bricks, this proposal to um, turn engineering from just a, a science where you're studying and doing ad hoc experimentation to an engineering discipline. And the way to do that is to go meta, is to create standards and mechanisms. And that paper um, that uh, Tom Knight wrote was actually really important. And Jason Kelly, the, the founder of Ginkgo says, you can draw a straight line from the ideas in that paper um, to uh, not just to Ginkgo, but the entire uh, synthetic biology industry was really built off this idea of how do we make biology, not just a science, but an engineering discipline. This is the original iGEM teams that were using those, that were building off those bio brick papers. And then here's an example, you know, 15 years later of all the students at the International Genetic Engineering um, Machines Conference creating bio bricks and participating in that um, really growing movement of, of standardizing biology. So if I had to, to put all of my lessons, if I was to talk to someone who said, hey, I wanna create a standard, what, what, do, what should I know? This is the, the kind of the gist of what I learned this summer, is you have to be laser focused on bottlenecks. You know, who are the stakeholders? Who are people who are closest to the problem and what is holding them all back? And then what, what is the actual goal? Is it safety? Is it interoperability? Is it performance? Is it contractual? You know, this is not, uh, this is not like just an academic um, discussion that we're having about standards. This is a really practical skill and problem that we need to get better at. You know, in the, in the course of writing this essay, a lot of really interesting things happened. Of course, this AI alignment discussion this AI, you know, that the technology keeps moving and the, the question about what to do about that has become, has taken a real, has been pushed into the spotlight. And Holden from uh, Open Philanthropy issued this call over the summer saying, I would love to, he commissioned uh, an RFI request for, for work proposals on safety standards. He just wanted more um, models. He wanted more stories about like, how, what are examples of safety standards that have worked? So the AI community is kind of grasping for like a, a basic understanding of, of safety standards. Um, you know, over this time, there was a, a report that came out about um, the carbon um, markets and the standards that are, that are at play there and that those are not verifiable. And the whole carbon market is like grasping for for what to do next. And the, I, I had so many people reach out to me from you know, the emerging uh, carbon dioxide removal industry saying our industry really needs standards and we don't know how to do that. So this is not like a, 
again, it's not an academic exercise to be studying this and wanting to do it better. It's something that's um, a, a central need for a lot of the um, emerging, not just uh, industries, but emerging technologies. It's not enough to be just creating companies. We actually need to start being creative and proactive and better about making standards. Um, like if you go and just keep riffing on this, if you read the Biden administration report on AI that they just put out, it talks all about standards. And it's it puts so much power into the National Institute of Standards um, that it's really it's really amazing to look at. And I and I do wonder what the folks at NIST are thinking now that they have been tasked with regulating AI and and creating all these standards. I'm I wish I could be a fly on the wall in those meetings to hear how they're thinking about that. Um, so anyways, the standards, these are the different standards making processes. And I think understanding the, how that process is changing is, is really central to getting better at it and improving it. And I think there's a lot of room for people to, um, to improve on it and to decide how we can do this better and to innovate and, and to start making stuff. And so that's the last message is to prototype, 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 to actually start building stuff. Um, because I think the the future standards are going to be going to be made and the people who are doing the making are the ones who are going to be doing the, the standardizing. And getting back to like our own challenges of, of marine connectivity and wanting to do that. Um, also over the course of the summer, we launched the Bristlemouth um, standard, which is an actual connector. You can see it there. It's just like the ones I showed you at the beginning. So it's an actual plug similar to like something you would use for USB or something like that. It's an actual interface, but it's also a, a protocol and a peer-to-peer -peer messaging framework that allows for new um, and modular ways to build not just underwater robotics, but all sorts of marine technologies, whether that's buoys and sensors. And the goal is that we have that same effect that that early um, CubeSat project had, where you know it was a simple design, but it lowered the barrier for people to actually get involved with building marine technology and not just building it, but also integrating that with the broader systems. So if you are interested in marine connectivity by any chance, we now have these dev kits for Bristlemouth. Um, and it's kind of cool building up the summer of protocols. It's not just, these aren't just essays, these are actual, you know, we're also building things that are gonna go, that are going out into the real world right now and people are building this. So the lessons and stuff that we're, that we're you know, thinking about in the, the summer of protocols community, we're actively using those um, in the, in the bristle mop development stuff. So that's pretty cool. And I have to give all the credit here to the team at so far, Tim Jansen, the CEO, Evan Shapiro, the CTO, um, Eric Stackpole, the, those are the ones who have done a lot of the heavy lifting and, and development with, with bristle mop. So, um, and the essay is now out in the world. So as Venkat and, and Tim and everyone said, the, Summer Protocols website is the place to find the essay. Everything that I've talked about today is cited there. Um, and you can uh, read the essay and give me your thoughts. So that's it. That's my uh, standard spiel. And uh, I hope the next time you see this uh, XKCD cartoon that you don't think, oh, standards that you get excited about it and that you're happy that more people are getting into the standards game. Thanks. Awesome, thanks so much, David. Um, yeah, do we have questions or comments from the uh, people here? Nothing's totally stumped. <laughs> Crickets. You just did such a good job explaining it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll kick us off with a um, couple of questions that have been on my mind. One is uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you had people from 
the climate world uh, reach out to you about like the need for standards and they don't know how to do it and they need a playbook. Mm -hmm. Well, you've done this research now, you have an essay to hand out, but like that sounds like the first step. What would it actually take to, I don't know, follow through on that kind of request? What are the next five steps to get people all the way to like, I don't know, on the journey of creating a standard? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific about that. So when I would tell people that I was researching, because of course, we we're all talking about this all summer. And there were a handful of people who thought, wow, I'm actually running into that exact problem right now. And I think they were like we were three years ago when we were just, we had seen the CubeSat and we wanted to do this for marine connectivity, but we didn't even know where to start looking. So it was really helpful for me to actually have the draft essay and just say, hey, read this. Like, this is where I'm at. This is all the research I've done. And a lot of folks told me that they found that really helpful. Just like giving a quick lay of the land and having a, the framing. Um, and I got to be honest with you, it's from there, they're all on different paths, right? Like the, the CDR folks are going in a different place than the AI folks. And it's, it's partially because one is a performance standard and another is a safety standard. But I think that the reality is um, we're at the very beginning of kind of developing this, this modern standards movement and, and building out the new protocols that are going to work when technology is moving this quickly. Um, so, you know, I think one of the, the things that would be an interesting um, and it's kind of one of my goals is not just to stop here with this, just like, okay, here's the essay and it's done, but figure out a way to create a common thread for those folks to share insights and knowledge and start to build a repository of, of what's working. Because I think, I think we're, still, we're still at the beginning. And, and I keep saying this comment, but I'm definitely not going to write a book about this. <laughs> Awesome, Dorian, question? Yeah, um, I, I like the idea of the, um, the, the other category, the, the, the contractual standards. Were we talking about that at all? Or was that something you came up with afterward? Um, because it occurs to me that like, not only is it a standard, but it's also a protocol, but it's also a social protocol. Um, and then it's an interesting example. And, and, and you got me sort of thinking about the, the common app thing, but also like uh, creative commons as well. Um, uh, insofar as, you know, you can just know that a CC, whatever, whatever version is, you know, what those terms entail. And then you don't have to think about it past that and how there's that kind of thing happening in other places. Um, and so I guess I'm sort of curious, like, where the when the the contractual uh, uh, standards uh, category came uh, sh showed up in your brain? <laughs> uh, the contractual standard has been there for a long time. I'm I'm kind of working on that with experiment, the experiment foundation stuff I'm doing because I I really think that contractual standards can be dead simple. Like Y Combinator publishing the safe note and giving that away is a really easy thing to do once you've done a little bit of the legal homework. Um, so I've been thinking about contractual standards for a long time. Um, I will say there's another, there's a, there's a, and this is kind of embarrassing because we did this project with the Ethereum foundation. I think there's this whole realm of, of smart contracts. And I think, um, crypto in general, I think you could make an argument is a, is a, almost a fourth wave of, of standards. Uh, um, I think that's being built and prototyped and uh, understood right now. And I had started to write about it and started to try and do that. But I realized that would have made the essay like twice as long. Um, and, and I think that's a whole companion piece. But I think, I think really trying to tie it, trying to tie what's happening uh, with Ethereum and crypto and, and, and everything in the that space to the longer history of standards is a really worthwhile effort to do it because I think it's really grounding. 
Um, so, yeah. and, and, and I bring that up because to me, a lot of that is, is around, those are like smart contracts. Um, and so anyways, that, that's a, an unfinished thread for someone else to pick up. <laughs> Jenna? Hey, David, uh, I've been really interested to hear your talk today, partly because for about 10 years, I've had a client in a naval architecture firm, marine engineering. And so I've been thinking a lot for a decade about um, robustness under harsh conditions in the ocean. Uh -huh. So one of the things I didn't see addressed in your piece is the robustness of the connector itself. Like how long does an O-ring last out in the ocean, right? And that there's something fun to tease there out there about the... Um, the robustness of a physical protocol and a robustness of a, of a you know, SMTP or a, a non-physical protocol. And I bet you have thought about that a lot. I'd be curious if you had any quick thoughts about that. Yeah. So um, one to of the, the O-ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, the O-ring life, I don't know about that. Um, we've designed this to go down to full ocean well, it's not rated to there yet, but I know it's been tested to full ocean depth and it's worked there. So, um, you know, thinking about making this robust. A lot of people who've never worked in the ocean, I'm glad that you have, because a lot of people who haven't don't realize just how harsh of an environment is. I think it's tougher than space in a lot of ways because there's salt water and, and biofouling and UV and all these incredible challenges that come into play when you're dealing with the ocean. Because a lot of folks who haven't would just say, well, why not just use USB? And it just is not um, uh, rugged enough to do that, um, to, to work in these marine environments. And so I think that kind of speaks to another um, reality of standards is, is standards emerge where the, the challenges are, right? Like USB is a, is a wonderful connector and is, is, but it's, it can't do everything. And so um you know, I just in the same way the bristlemouth connector is not going to be is not going to be able to do everything. Um, I think, but hopefully it like fills enough of a gap and then gets the next person thinking about uh, building a standard where these other gaps um, uh, emerge. So, um, yeah, happy to talk offline about uh, the actual uh, technical specs on the the connector too. I wanted to chime in and share my screen since the question brought it up anyway, but uh, one of the most fun artifacts in the kit is actually a poster made from the CAD drawings of um, Bruce Mouth connectors that uh, David and Eric shared with us. Uh, and uh, as I was looking at this, I remembered that, that I actually do have like a very small uh, personal episode with um, marine stuff, like right after my postdoc, one of the jobs I applied to was uh, at a place called Embari, the Monterey Bay um, something research uh, institution. So they do oceanographic research and they were hiring to work on that generation of AUE. So these things look like uh, uh, 10 foot long torpedoes with uh, you open up the hatch and there's like a whole mess of cabling there. And uh, I had like an initial conversation with uh, the research lead to talk about what was required. And I basically ran away scared. It was uh, at th that era of like underwater robotics was seriously scary. Like you had to do everything that like, you know, complex space programs do in what is in some ways a harsher environment. And then um, six years later, when I saw your thing, uh, open ROV thing, David, I was like, all right, this is starting to get to the point where I feel even I could hack at it. And now this bristlemouth connector, I think you brought it down to a level. Um, I don't know where it's Arduino level now. So it's amazing to see that in the last 20 years, I would say, it was this 2006? Okay, so almost 18 years. This has gone from like scary, intimidating space grade technology to something that's sort of like just within reach of uh, somebody with the right engineering background to something that can be hacked away at by high school kids, I think, like this is going to get simple enough that uh, I think a 16 year old could throw together and research grade AUE. So it's kind of like important put the in context what these kinds of efforts actually do. So yeah, congrats to Eric for pulling this off. 
Thank you. I, you know, I can't take any credit. It's all, you know, Evan Shapiro and, and Eric Stackpole, and they did an amazing job building this. And, and to be honest with you, we still have a ways to go. I mean, this is, this is V1. Um, and like, it needs to have to be able to take higher power before we can really do vehicle stuff. It's like really good for sensor integration right now. Anyways, we still have a long way to go. And I think that's one of the things that I was talking about in the essay is like, it took CubeSat 10 years. And that like, that kind of timeline is, is beyond what most startups and most companies can actually think about working in. And so that's another aspect of this, this realm that I think is different is the time scales are a little bit different and hardware is really tough, but I, but the goal is absolutely to make this um, is to have that same impact that you saw with the, the, the SpaceX ride sharing launch is like, okay, this is, we're doing this differently now. And so to think on to, when you get, when you start using standards as like a, when you really use them as a creative tool, um, you know, your timelines change the the opportunity space changes um, and the way of working changes. Like you're actually calling up your competitors, talking in a different way to them about how to collaborate. And I think it's a really, um, it's a muscle that like we as a, especially in the technology community haven't developed enough. It has, there's a whole culture around open source software. Um, you know, like working in public is, is a great example of, of that culture, a great des description of that culture. Like we need that to that those cultural um, muscles to be developed um, beyond just software. So it's we're still early days of all of that. Hey David, thanks for your talk. I was wondering um, if in your research is the is the EU's uh, imposition of USB C in a very like top down totalizing way is that sort of a unprecedented um legal uh, mandate of a, a technical standard or do you see parallel examples of that um in in history um so i i think i'm going to guess that you're referring to the kind of what europe just did to what the european union just did with apple where they um, they said they mandated that their okay. iPhones and things are using USB-C. Um, you know, that is a really interesting um, thing. I, I'm following, I'm following that. First of all, well, you got to, I spent a lot of time on the early days of USB. So like when it was just like this small project from someone at, the, you know, like a someone at Intel who wanted to make this, this work. Um, so I was focusing a lot on the early days. I think there's a lot to um, still be written about standards and power. And what you're talking about is a really prime example. Is like, how do you take, um, how do you, what is the relationship between, what should be the relationship between the state and the standards makers? Because, you know, like, I think what Biden has done with AI is really, is going to be really interesting because it, there's a difference between a standard and a regulation. A standard is something that usually is bottom up, developed by people on the front lines. And a regulation is something that's top down. And this is like the, this gets to the whole, like seeing like a state thing um, where, you know, like rules just come from on high. And I, and I'm really, I think that is a whole separate essay that could be part of the book that someone else writes um, is the relationship between standards and power, because there's like halfway through the, the, the program, I found a whole emerging literature on the way that they're thinking about standards in China, which is actually quite different. And it's, it's a lot closer to the way that I'm thinking about it. Um, this kind of disruptive model. And so, Anyways, I think uh, standards and power. Someone else, someone else should do it. Great. Any other questions or comments for David?
Well, the other thing I'll say is that everyone always tells me about their favorite standard. So if you have those, you can message me later and tell me stories. I love hearing these um, wild, um, these these nuanced stories of how standards were created and and all the the miscellaneous of these these stories. They really um, they're they're always fun. So please keep sending me them. You how many of you already have? I will say, ever since reading your essay, every time I see an ISO printed on something, I have to go and be like, what is the standard? It's just like some random number. And, and now I need to know, like, what, what is the standard that is printed on this cooler, for example, or or something else? So thanks for the nerd snipe there. I don't know if there's anything in the forum that I haven't seen. I haven't opened that up. David, yeah. I'm curious about something. Is it does does Bristlemouth use USB for data transfer and power, or is it a completely from the ground up data protocol? Uh, there is a custom pub sub network in there. I'm putting the networking stack into the thread right there. But if you go to um, bristlemouth.org slash documentation, you can see the um, you can see the networking stack. So there is an IP layer, but we build a custom we built we did build a custom network interface. Um, uh, yeah but you can see that all there. I'm saying we, it was, you know, it was Evan Shapiro and Charles Cross and, and not me. <laughs> These people deserve all the credit for it. You know, to, to speak to that broader team effort, I actually think this is um, an important point is the way that we got this done at so far, the way that we convinced the board and everyone that we, it was, was worthwhile to work on is we had a really important partnership with um, the Office of Naval Research and Ocean Kind and a handful of other really, I think, bold and brave ocean philanthropists who underwrote the development of this kind of thing. And so you talk about um, you know contractual standards. I think what we did, which is close to what Michael Kramer wrote about in his patent buyout paper, kind of a patent buyout light. I think there's a whole world of um, like contractual or philanthropic uh, techniques to develop, to encourage and to um, embolden this kind of standards making. Because there's a lot, a lot of times, this, and this is something I wrote about, it's not a tragedy of the commons situation. The, the failure of standards is often that they just don't get made in the first place. And so I think there's a lot of interesting uh, market mechanisms that we could potentially build that pull these public goods into existence. And to me, that's what's, you know, Venkat, you said, that's one of the most exciting new threads in the, like the latest um, crypto like turn, the, the creation of public goods. There is an economic component to that. And to the extent we can pull those public goods forwards using those um, market mechanisms, I think is incredibly compelling. And, and I, I'm with you in, in having a lot of enthusiasm about all of the, the interest and discussions that are happening um, in that regard. Again, that could be a whole other chapter in this book. I didn't have, I didn't have time to, or space to put it in. All right, any other last thoughts or questions? Josh, ask David for a picture of a bristle mouth for us. <laughs> we looked and never found one. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll add that is the, the, the name bristle mouth is, um, it's named after this fish um, that's the most ubiquitous fish in the ocean. Um, and there's a bunch of um, fun 
standard stories that I heard about naming. I, like Bluetooth was named after King, like a king in Denmark who united all of the 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 parts of the country. And and um, I think the the naming of standards is underrated. Maybe another section in your not book. <laughs> All right, well, if we have no more questions or comments, I think we can probably wrap it up a little early today. Thanks again, David, for the enlightening talk and the great essay uh, that you can all see at summerprotocols.com or by signing up to request your protocol kit. Uh, we will see you all next week, Wednesday, December 20th, for another researcher salon with Rafa. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. <laughs>